Spirit of God, we pray that you make this living word enable us to see the holy places in the wilderness, places of our own lives. Make it so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are in the third chapter of Exodus, reading verses 1 through 10. As we continue to talk about holy currencies today, we are looking about time and place. And I can think of no other passage that talked about the relationship of holy time and place than this well-known story of the burning bush. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. Moses led the flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God, to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want you to think for a moment about the places in your own life where you have found sacred space. Places where they often talk about in Celtic spirituality and, well, frankly, our pagan roots. The thin places where we have a sense that there is God and a presence beyond what we can actually quantify. The interesting thing about most of those places is it's not something about that place which is particularly special. It's probably because you had a moment, a time, where you encountered grace or community or even God's presence in a glimpse. It wasn't about the stones and the rocks. It was about what was happening, what had been prepared. What makes a space sacred? Well, if you're Presbyterian, particularly in the southern wing of the Presbyterian Church, our uh, holiest place is Montreat. Has anyone been there? Mm -hmm. Montreat. And you can speak to probably the power of that place. I, I've never been there. I have never been there, I have to admit that. And when I was in seminary in Atlanta, this became a big deal. And so then, because I was getting so much pressure to go there, I swore I would never go there. And now that I live far enough away not to get there, I wished I had taken up on the opportunity. But what I hear from people who have been there, when they come back and talk about the experience, I mean, first of all, it is the mountains of North Carolina. And they are beautiful. And you're away from the hustle and bustle of daily life. And you're often there with people you have known, or as you come to know more intimately through prayer and time together, that that space can comes to take on a sacred meaning for those who have been there. But the truth is, and if we're all honest, there's nothing really particularly special about that spot in the mountains in North Carolina. It's the people who are there and the things that have happened in that process. Eric Law talks about this in his book, in his own experiences, he recounts a couple of times in his life where he was overwhelmed 
by the spiritual presence and what had happened. And then he was so excited that he decided to go back and become a counselor in the same place. And what he found out was, in order to create the sacred space for all those who were gathering, that the people who were organizing had to work a lot. They had to make sure that all the things were in place. And what it reminded me, as I heard his story, is that sacred space doesn't just accidentally happen. If you build it, it doesn't mean it's going to be sacred. And so, in some ways, when we think about sacred spaces, we have a tendency of looking at traditional religious spaces. And lo and behold, if you look at, particularly in the Old Testament, but even in the New, the holiest places, the places where God shows up, usually isn't in the religious communities. Not in their temples, not in their places where they've gathered, with some rare exceptions. In fact, it's such a rare exception that when John the Baptist's father, who had the special duty of going into the holiest of holies in the temple, when God actually shows up and talks to him, he's a little dubious about that. <laughs> Sometimes we get so used to being in our sacred spaces that we forget that God will even be there, or sometimes forget that God is all around us. So let me take us back to Moses and talk a little bit more about specific sacred what happens with Moses is he encounters God, and a lot of times in the lectionary, they cut it right off when God says, the place you're standing is holy ground. Right? We found this holy moment, and now we want to cling to it. People will fight over holy spaces, right? You only have to look at the Middle East to know that to be true. Because that space, and we forget, it's not that space. There's a tradition. No one knows where Moses is buried, right? I don't know if you knew that. No one knows where Moses is buried. And there's a reason for that. It's because they didn't want to turn his graveside into a holy space because, as he said, no one should worship me. It's about worshiping God alone who is everywhere. So let's take back to the story to talk about this. Moses goes out to the wilderness and he's about his daily work. His job as the son-in-law of the priest of Midian is to take care of the sheep. So Moses is just doing his daily job. He's going about his daily work, tending the sheep, keeping them alive, dealing with all the things that sheep come with. And he goes into the wilderness, but he goes beyond the wilderness for some reason. We don't know why. Did Moses know that this mountain was holy? Or is that the narrator telling us it's holy? Moses is going to find out later. I have a feeling that Moses has no idea. And so he's been out with sheep so long that he sees this burning bush and it's not burning down. He probably has to go, I've, I've got to take a double take. I haven't seen another human being for a while. I don't know what's going on. So I'm going to go take a look at this bush. And lo and behold, this is where the messenger of God speaks. Take off your shoes for where you were standing is holy ground. It happens to other folks within the Old Testament in particular. Jacob, after he had stolen from his brother, runs into the wilderness grabs a rock, falls asleep in the middle of the wilderness, and has a dream. And in that dream, it's basically, you've heard, you've heard the story of Jacob's ladder. Right? It's actually this grand staircase where heaven and earth are meeting in this spot in the middle of nowhere. And Jacob wakes up and goes, oh, God's in this place. So oftentimes, God shows up in the most unexpected ways. But not just to feed us. Right? Have you ever heard that term before? You know, People go, I, I go to church to be fed. And that's true, but it's only half true, right? If we end the story with Moses having an encounter with God and this space is holy, Moses is going to keep taking that flock out there and try to have, relive that experience with God. And God says these things. I have observed the misery of my people. Now you know stuff's about to get real. God creates this space that's holy and then says... We've got to do something about the injustice. I heard the cries. I know the suffering. And I have come to deliver them because I know their oppressors. So I'm sending them to you. Now, here's the thing about holy moments, sacred places, and this sort of thing. If that encounter in the holy moments in the sacred place doesn't send you to do something for someone else and live in the world a different way, we might be a little dubious about whether or not that was God's voice or your own voice. 
That's always the complexity. My favorite scene, if you've not seen it, The Prince of Egypt. If you've seen that movie, and if you haven't, you can probably YouTube it and find that scene. So Steven Spielberg is the producer of this film. He worked with a number of rabbis. And what they did was, is they created the voice of God, and in it was a conglomeration of Moses' voice, the voice of his mother, the voice of his sister, the voice of his brothers, the voice of the people who had been around him. And it all came together to say that sometimes, and this is the, the rabbi's interpretation, what he was hearing was the voice, God comes to us in all sorts of different ways. And sometimes we're not always prepared for it. And sometimes it can come in the midst of our daily tasks. So I'm sending you. So this brings us a little bit more to, so I've been up here now, let's talk a little bit more reality. Since Moses was on holy ground and it was just dirt on a mountain in the desert, let's talk about real stuff for just a moment, right? Eric Law talks about the currency of time and place. So I want to take just a moment to talk about this issue of place, right? For years, people would either say, oh, our place here on the corner is either a benefit or a detriment. And, and, and the truth is, um, I think it's wrong way at it. I think the idea is that this is a currency that we've been given, that we have, that, that people before us, and this is important to remember on this All Saints Day, like we're going to gather around the table in a little bit, and we're going to celebrate an event that's been going on long before we were ever around for thousands of years. And will go on long after we are us. And we are participants in this. And the truth is, this building is the same thing. This place where we have been called to serve in this place. And the law says that what urban churches often do is they forget that the value that they've been given to give to others. So there's a group called Partners for Sacred Space. And they have been looking at urban congregations, and they estimate that on average, your urban congregations provide over $140,000 worth of resource to a community every year by providing space, by, by giving of their facilities to others. And so I started thinking, I wonder what that looks like for us. We have in the past been a space we've given for the organizing for the fast food workers movement. In fact, it's so large now that it's difficult for them to fit in here, so they often have to go to larger places. However, we also now provide space for the University of Missouri Extension Program. But this isn't just about providing space. We're always looking for ways to be connected with one. There's nowhere that they could get the space that they need at rent value that they're getting here. But it's not just about that, right? It's not just about that currency, because then we begin to understand they have programs and we have space, and what are the ways that we can join together to be involved and continue to let these currencies flow? Some of you might be aware that Veterans for Peace uh, meets in the building here once a month on Monday nights, uh, usually uh, always on uh, session night, so it works out pretty well. We leave the door open. They've been great stewards, because we walk out to church, tell them to turn off the lights and hit the alarm button, and that's all they have to do. And without a few exceptions here and there, it works out pretty well. Um, and, and they want to know more about who we are, and it's good to know who they are. But this is only the beginning. So here's the thing. My guess is each one of you probably has some idea of the ways in which we could let this currency flow to open up who we are. If you have that idea, I just encourage you to write it down and put it in the offering. We'll figure that out. But here's the thing. We have this grand corner in this space and this facility, and everyone who walks in here says, wow, what could we do with this currency? That's an open-ended question that I'm not going to answer, because if I did, then it would just be my answer and my part of that truth. But we need to hear from everybody. But today we're not just talking about the currency of place. We're also talking about the currency of time. And so I want to talk about your time for just a minute. It is really important that we are good stewards of your time and that we're good stewards of one another's time. And why is that important? Well, here's the thing. If we don't plan our time well, if we don't plan our lives well, then we end up chasing down things that are not all that important, or at least not the most important things for us, for you. By planning our time and prioritizing what we want to do, we are, in essence, valuing this gift so that we are able to give it to others. Imagine, just for a moment, that we prioritized our time in such a way that everybody in our 
church family and community was able to take a real step on a regular basis. I am convinced the only way we can really take Sabbath is to do some planning. So the question for us then becomes out of this is, is we prepare to take those time and talents for us. Usually we're like, yep, I've done this, do this, do this, and pass it. Don't do it that way this year. I want you to take it, I want you to pray over it and go, do I really want to do that? Is that really where my best energy is spent? If I look at that and go, yeah, 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 yeah. don't do it. Because that's probably not where God's calling. If you have to grudgingly do something in the life of faith on a daily basis, then it could be a sign that that's probably the not best thing, the best use of the currency that God's given you of time. So take that form for a moment and, and see it as a possibility for liberation. And here's what I mean by that. You can, you can say, you know what, this year's a new year and I'm going to do something completely different. I've always wanted to do X, Y, and Z, or something's going on around us, and so I'm going to do something different. And this is how I'm going to offer my life and my time in the coming year. Because if we don't take some time to plan for this next year, personally, as well as corporately, we'll find ourselves here next year wishing we had made X, Y, and Z decisions. God has given each one of us the gift and there are some of those places in our lives where we just don't have control over because we have to do X, Y, and Z, because we have family concerns and work concerns. Those are all part of our lives, our health concerns. But Eric Law does this really interesting thing. In the middle of it, it takes about two or three pages in this chapter on time and place. It says, if you just watch less TV. Then I thought, well, you know, people aren't watching network television in the generations to come, but how about how much time you spend on your smartphone that isn't related to education or work or it's just time spent going like this. If you all know what I'm doing when I'm doing this, right? For those who don't know, if you if you, you can hold the, hold your phone and just go like this and it'll it'll scroll the screen and you can spend hours just doing this. And nothing changes. It used to be like what we do with the TV remote. You just turn the channel immediately. Somewhere in each one of our lives there's something like that that eats away at our time. That if we were honest, we would say, you know, that's not really where I want to spend the bulk of my time. So just take a quarter of that and say, I'm going to steal back that time and I'm going to use it for ways that are part of that, that I want to live in the world. So as we think about the gifts of time and place where we are, it is my hope and my prayer going forward that we'll be able to reclaim some of that freedom Christ has given us and, and use it to be part, not for ourselves, but for figuring out where God is hearing the cries, hearing the suffering, <laughs> hearing the oppression. Not in Egypt, but right here in St. Louis. All of us talk about the issues of justice. We talk about wanting to be part of building God's beloved community. Truth is, we've got too much on our plate sometimes to actually do anything about it. That's why it's so important to evaluate what we're doing and how we're spending our time. If we're not using our time collectively in this place to be about the work of justice, the ending of oppression, with all the resources we've been given, then we can't cling to that mantra of being a glimpse of God's love in the dark. So in the coming weeks, be in prayer, be in prayer, and figure out where you're going to steal back time so you and we together can be part of this justice work.